So what my goal is today is to like deep dive a little bit deeper into the technical background behind headless WordPress. And so it's not so much like what is it, but we'll actually get in and look at some REST API stuff, look at WP GraphQL, um, and then hopefully go through some cool examples to show you all, you know, building, building headless WordPress apps uh, at a particular complexity. Yes. And Sam just gave me a really good reminder that we are going to be recording this session for posterity. I should have said that at the beginning. Um, so don't say anything that you don't want in posterity. So with that, um, we'll kick it off and, and get rolling. And so I, I always like to start with these couple of slides when we when we have an intro session like this. We're talking about what is headless WordPress. Um, because I think a lot of people have this misconception about what it is, and, and we like to dispel those myths kind of right away. And so the way that I like to describe headless WordPress is that it's an architectural pattern and not a specific set of technologies. So the extended metaphor that I like to use here is like the idea of building a house, right? We have different construction techniques all over the world. Maybe your house is made of concrete block, maybe it's made of wood, maybe it's made of metal, just depending on your environment and the aesthetic preferences of whatever region you're in. And I think websites in a lot of ways are the same, right? They can be built out of all these different materials, have all these different aesthetic preferences, and it's not really one set of specific technologies. So even though what we try to do at WP Engine is recommend you like a smooth onboarding path, that doesn't mean that that set of technologies that we may recommend is the only set of technologies that you can use. And it's really uh, up to your heart's desire to um, figure out what those are gonna be for your particular use case. So what I always like to do is compare and contrast traditional WordPress with headless WordPress. And so we've got here just two architectural diagrams these are the only ones I'm going to show you, but I think they're kind of important for setting the stage for what traditional WordPress does versus what headless WordPress provides. So this is a diagram of the way that traditional WordPress works, right? You got WordPress here at the core, and this thing is really the mediator of all of the different interactions with that site. So it mediates the interaction with the visitor. So when they request a particular URL, maybe it gets served from a CDN, but ultimately WordPress is going to let say what's in this URL, what data do I need to fetch, and then how am I going to render that using your traditional theming tools? And it sends that back to the visitor. Similarly, the publisher interacts directly with the WordPress admin interface. Uh, they, they enter their content, maybe they're using some advanced content modeling tools uh, to do that, but that's their primary method of creating data, creating content for the web. And the developer has the same direct interaction with WordPress, right? If I want to make the website look different, I need to write a PHP theme. Or if I need to add some functionality, I write a PHP plugin. Um, and maybe I layer on some JavaScript or some custom CSS, or I'm using Elementor or some sort of page builder. But it's either way, like my actions as a developer uh, go directly into that kind of WordPress core wrapper. And, and that's what creates traditional WordPress. So headless WordPress, on the other hand, uh, is a little bit more complex. And I like to call that out whenever we show this diagram because it's true. And there are reasons why we may want to make things more complex. And we'll get to those in just a second. Um, but it enables a, an entirely different pattern of development. Um, and it really frees developers up to do some cool things, in my opinion. So if we look at this here, you know, we see WordPress uh, is still a part of this equation, of course, as headless WordPress, but it's being used in a very different capacity. And so if we start our journey over here on the right-hand side with our visitor, uh, you know, they're still maybe requesting that site.com slash page, but instead of that request being routed directly to the WordPress backend, it gets intercepted by typically a JavaScript-based application. And so I'm just going to use that as an example for right now. But when we look at it here in a minute, you'll see that there are lots of other opportunities for what this runtime can be, doesn't necessarily need to be a JavaScript application, could be an iOS app, an Android app, like an internet of things, kiosk, like whatever you want, it, it will do because it's that application's job to then take that request from the user, fetch the necessary data from WordPress's APIs, either REST or WP GraphQL, wait for it to return, and then it decides how it's going to render that ultimate output to the user. Um, so again, this is serving that front end presentation layer of our application uh, and not WordPress. WordPress's responsibility now is to number one, serve as the API for our data store to our front end application, but then also still uh, facilitating that direct interaction with the content publisher. So the content publisher, nothing has changed. They come in, they interact with WordPress in the same way 
that they would, um, and all that stuff works beautifully, beautifully for them. Now, what that allows us as developers to do is to focus our efforts on that front end application. It also allows us to break out of the constraints of traditional WordPress theming and allows us to use uh, newer front end frameworks that give us, you know, better developer experience that ultimately end with uh, better products for our users um, under, under certain circumstances. So like I said, this diagram is a little bit more complex and, and that's I think intended in, in an okay consequence because by choosing to adopt this headless strategy, you know, you get a couple of these benefits. And I like to highlight these benefits um, in a couple of different ways. And I think one, it's important to point out that these aren't necessarily like mutually exclusive. Like you're not gonna just turn on headless and by default, like you will get some of these page speeds. But what I, what I like to say is that these aren't impossible to achieve in traditional WordPress. It just might be a little bit harder to do um, or, or sometimes take a lot more work. So like site speed and core web vitals. There are certain techniques and uh, things that get applied when we're using something like say Next.js to create our front end that automatically speed up our website. Next.js uses something called link prefetching, which is a really, a really cool technique. Um, and what it means is that before, like if I'm a user and I hover over a link, Next.js goes and fetches the data at that subsequent page before I've navigated to it, right? So like it's what enables those snappy page transitions. Um, and as a result, you get these really good core web vitals. You know, WordPress has gotten a really bad rap for having bad security practices over the years. And so one of the things that we enable by going headless is that basically your WordPress instance just becomes your API. It's not the front door for your website anymore. And so people really have to go out of their way to figure out that you're using WordPress at all, if, if it's even possible. Because um, under some circumstances, that's totally hidden and there's no artifact that it's WordPress and it looks like any other Next.js application. Um, Another thing we hear a lot from developers who are interested in exploring headless is the improved developer experience. You know, the, the traditional WordPress PHP theming kind of is what it is, hasn't changed a lot in the last 10 years. And then at, at the same time, we have these, these changes in WordPress core around full site editing. And some people have realized, hey, that that future isn't really for me, but I still want to use WordPress. And so I think headless provides them a way to do that while still exploring some of the newer front end technologies that the JavaScript world is creating. Um, and then another important takeaway from this is that because we're developing now in JavaScript and like most of our JavaScript frameworks like you know, React, Vue, Svelte, they're all based around this idea of component-driven development, right? The component is kind of the smallest unit of a website and we use those components to then compose these larger user interfaces as opposed to being template driven, which uh, traditional WordPress theming is. So I think it just lends itself to the idea that, hey, I'm gonna create this nice brand style guide and have you know, all my storybook components. It, it enables that style of development in a much uh, cleaner way than you would be able to do that with traditional WordPress. And I'm like, I'm not saying it's impossible. It's just more difficult in my opinion to, to do that. Uh, and then the last benefit is that since we're using WordPress pretty much solely as an API, we get the benefit of writing once and then publishing everywhere. So once we have that data in WordPress, that same REST or GraphQL API can power an unlimited number of clients, right? If I want to have two different websites pulling from that data store, you can. If I want to have an Internet of Things, you know, kiosk or something like that doing it, I can, or different mobile apps. Um, so it really enables a lot of um, content reuse and reusability when you sort of abstract away the presentation layer and say, I'm just going to put my data in here and then send it out to these different services over, over APIs. Um, so going back to our little house metaphor, uh, I want to talk about like the raw materials that we use to, to build headless WordPress with. This is where we'll kind of start to get into a little bit more technical stuff. Um, and so we'll start at the API layer, because really, from my perspective, that's the core of what we're doing with headless WordPress is we're saying we don't want any of WordPress's presentation capabilities. We're using you solely as a content management system and as an API layer to feed other applications. Um, and there are two main ways that people accomplish that in WordPress. There's the REST API and then there's GraphQL. And we're going to take a look at both. And I'm just going to double check what we're doing on time. And I think we're good. OK, so the REST API. REST, uh, if you've been around the web development world, chances are you probably use some sort of REST API um, in the past. And 
you know, they're pretty ubiquitous and REST architecture focuses on creating an endpoint for each resource, right? We've got an endpoint for posts, an endpoint for categories, authors, pages, and that's a great organizational pattern. But when we're requesting a lot of data, sometimes that means we need to make multiple round trips to get all the data we need. Or in the case of the WordPress API, sometimes we get back way more data than we need. And I'll show you what that looks like in a, in a second. And there are kind of some methods to address this. Uh, but not fully. And so like an example down here is I would need to do two requests if I wanted to get me the post data with the post ID of 29 and then get all the pages written by the author with the ID of nine. You know, that that's maybe that's the same author that wrote this post. I want all the pages they wrote too, right? I'm going to need to make two separate requests because those are two separate endpoints. We got posts, we got pages. You can't really mix collections with REST. Now, GraphQL, on the other hand, is a declarative query language that turns the WordPress database into uh, a, essentially a data graph via this really awesome plugin called WP GraphQL. So typically the way that this works is that there's just one GraphQL endpoint that accepts these formatted queries and then will return you whatever sort of data that you specify. So the benefit there is that we can get any piece of data that we want from all across the graph, all in one query. And I think like really the what I'm seeing as sort of the barrier to people adopting this is just sort of the added complexity, right? It's another plugin. It's not a core part of WordPress. Um, if you look at plugins out there that you're interested in using headlessly, lots of them have REST API support built in, um, but not all of them have GraphQL support built in. And so that's sort of a place where you see the community evolving and like sort of stepping up to make you know, more and more of that just work out of the box with that one plugin. But going back to our example query, right? With GraphQL, I can specify that all in one query. I can say, get me the post data with the post ID of 29 and all of the pages written by that same author with the ID of nine, all in one query. And maybe that's what I need to, uh, you know, do my user interface. Um, so now let's take a look at some of those things in a little bit more detail. And, uh, One sec, keyboard malfunction. Okay, there we go. Okay, so yeah, I wanna take a look at these things in a little bit more detail and we'll spend uh, just a few minutes sort of going over some examples of how, how you would use these two different things. Um, so what I've got here is, I don't know how many of you all have used a different like API client, but I found one recently that I really like called HTTPy. Um, and this is a web-based, REST, really, really API client, however you want to uh, call that. And its whole purpose is just to facilitate you making different API requests. And I like exploring in these types of playgrounds because it typically like lowers the complexity that I'm dealing with when I'm exploring an API. So if I'm exploring an API, I can just, you know, queue up the call that I have here. And, um, you know, I don't have to worry about is something in my code breaking or am I not doing formatting the request right? It just takes away um, a little bit of the complexity as I'm starting to develop these tools. So like I said before, uh, the WordPress REST API comes inside of core. Um, and so here, I'll show you how we can get to that, right? And this is available on pretty much any WordPress site unless you've turned it off. Um, so I've got my website queued up right here, jeffreyeverhart.com. And I access the WordPress REST API using this route, wp-json slash wp slash v2. And what this is going to do is this is sort of the introspection route where WordPress tells me what I can get from the API. So if I if I click send, it'll send off this request. Um, and then I get all of these different routes that are available. And this is basically like what is available to me as a developer to get out of the API and how do I use it? I mean, so if you're ever kind of questionable about like, oh, I wonder if it has this, you know, just go into that root URL. You can explore all those different endpoints and see what you get. So for here, you know, for example, we've got like posts and then we've got posts with a particular ID to get that particular post. And that's really how REST is organized. Um, and so we'll come down here and start looking at some of those post examples and you can see that in practice, right? So if I want to get, you know, say like the first 10 posts um, from my website, that this is how I would construct that query, right? I've got my wp-dation.slash v2 slash posts. Um, and then I've got this per page equals 10 and this embed uh, query parameter on there. And we'll talk about what those mean in a second. So if I send that off, I'm going to get some data back that looks like this. Like I've got the ID, um, I've got date, I've got, you know, slug status. I've got my rendered content, which is HTML that I can then use uh, in subsequent applications. So that's how I would sort of use this headlessly. 
Um, and, and this is the idea behind REST is that this is, it's all built around these endpoint collections. And so say, for example, I wanted to get just the data about this post uh, with the ID of 240, 2466. I would just sort of append that to the URL, right? I'm going to put that parameter in the next path slice. And then when I send that back, um, I get just data about that post. Um, and so it's great. Like we have this nice open API that we can use, um, but there are some limitations there and they're there for a good reason. Because I think once I start talking about the idea that there's this open API, people tend to get a little bit nervous. Um, but I think it's important to remember that this whole API, as well as the GraphQL API that we're going to take a look at in just a second, are also protected by all of the mechanisms uh, and capability checks that WordPress enforces naturally, right? So I'm just any user and we would expect any user to be able to look at a post, right? That's what we want. That's why we've got this public blog. But a revision of a post is a protected type. I need to be an author. I need to be an editor. I need permissions to be able to see those things. Um, so like if I open up this endpoint, which would get me revisions for that particular post and click send, we can see that it's going to send me back this, you know, this 401 error because I'm not authorized to view that. Like I haven't provided my credentials, I'm not logged into WordPress. So it still protects those things for me. So even though it's open, um, I don't think you really need to be nervous about that because any of those protected endpoints are still subject to the same capability checks that they would be in regular WordPress. Um, and so you can, you can authenticate and do things a couple of different ways there, but that's kind of beyond what we're going to talk about today. Um, okay, so that's, that's that's sort of the basics of the REST API and how you would sort of navigate around that. Um, one of the things I did say in the other presentation that I always like to make people aware of is that we do have these kind of query parameters where, where we can add on additional details to that request to sort of get more data, exclude data, or you know pass in parameters like telling it how many results we want. Um, and you do that by just having this query, this uh, question mark, you know, your param equals, you know, the value. And that's what these fields and embed properties do. Fields will sort of help you exclude data to prevent overfetching. And then this embed parameter will actually include additional data for you if it's embeddable. So things like featured images, author data, you can actually get back in a REST API request just in one request uh, using those things. Um, but if you look at some of the data that comes back here, like, there's a ton of data, right? And so for us in an application to traverse this um, could be really difficult and time consuming, right? So we've got links, what, what, what is all this stuff? Do we need this? And links are actually all of the things that we can, we can embed. Um, let me actually go back here and let me get uh, a larger one. So I'm gonna just go back and request my basic posts. So we can see here that we get back a ton of data, right? You know, 493 kilobytes for 10 posts. Um, a lot of that is content. We can see we also get the excerpt. And then if you have plugins installed like Yoast, it will add all sorts of extra data to your request that you may or may not want there. Um, and so there's not really, like I said, we can use the field stuff, but it's not it's not a great or clean way. Um, and so that's when a lot of people reach for WP GraphQL. So let's look at that by comparison over here on the left. So I'm just hopping into a demo WordPress site that I've got installed. Um, and I've opened up my graphical IDE. And so uh, WP GraphQL is a plugin that I have installed that you can get from the WP um, plugin repository. And we can install that, activate it. Uh, it. It sort of defaults to being public by default, which I think is a good thing. So it's sort of like the REST API. Um, and there's a settings menu here where you can restrict it and turn some things on. And we can see here that it will also tell us where our GraphQL endpoint is. And so like we got, you know, like I mentioned in the previous couple of slides, GraphQL is typically just one endpoint and we send all of our queries to that one endpoint uh, via post requests. Um, so I'm gonna hop back in here. And one of the other reasons that people tend to gravitate toward GraphQL is because we get such great tooling around it sort of built into WordPress. So this is the graphical IDE. And what this allows us as developers to do is to compose our queries here and then sort of use them in our applications. Um, so if I click this query composer window and you know, say like, I just wanted to get, um, we'll go and sort of replicate my post request, right? So we'll say we're gonna get some posts and then we're gonna get some data inside the post. We want the date, we want the excerpt, um, we want the title, we got to go back up, we want the content, 
And then let's say we also want the featured image and then we'll sort of dig down into the featured image and get, we get to select just what data we want there. I think we want like media item URL. Um, and then we'll come back up here and we'll get like, it's all text. Okay. And so we'll go ahead and run that query and we can preview all of that in real time, which is really nice. So that allows us to go compose this query, run it, make sure it returns the data we want before we're mucking around inside of our app. And then when we're ready, we can just copy and paste this query and use it inside of our application, um, which I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll kind of demo here in just a second. Um, and if you look at this data, you know, a lot of it is the same, um, but it's also structured very differently. And so one of the things I mentioned was the idea of overfetching, where with the REST API, we, we do have less control over what data comes back, where with WP GraphQL, we sort of specify exactly what we want and it comes back in that exact shape. Um, so it's a lot easier to, tra to traverse, it's a lot easier to navigate, um, and you're not wasting a bunch of bandwidth getting data that you're just going to throw away or exclude as you like render your components. Um, so cool, let's do just a check on time, All right, we're at 226, okay, cool. Um, I think we're, we're rolling ahead. And any, Fran, any questions in the chat you think we should loop back on before I, I switch yeah. us and talk about content modeling? Yeah, there was none. Uh, Jeff, everybody's um, okay. kind of getting stoked and cruising along in this. Uh, I love Very GraphQL, cool. y'all. It's definitely. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm becoming a convert slowly. And I'm slow, slow to change my technology preferences and have to run <laughs> with REST for a while. Although you might um, change me to REST because you showed me some tricks. But I think from a perspective there, there of There are like, some tricks. Yeah, there are some tricks. Um, I I threw a link to Kellen's video about W or REST versus GraphQL, but I think mm -hmm. the um, if there's anybody in the audience that that has kind of like are kind of new to um, to one API versus the other one, uh, Kellen's video does a really good job of explaining the trade offs and what what you should use when. Also, yes, one of my yes. favorite jokes is on there. <laughs> One of my favorite dev jokes. Anyway, so anyway, all right. <laughs> uh, like I said, somewhere in between a free form conversation and a conference presentation. So this is this is what y'all signed up for. So welcome. Thanks for hanging in there with us. Um, yeah. So GraphQL, like lo lots of lots of stuff to like about WP GraphQL, and it's only going to get better. Um, that we're working on some caching mechanisms for this that are going to make it faster. Um, and so that's one of the biggest beefs that I think people have with WP GraphQL was its lack of cacheability. And that's something that's actively sort of being addressed. So look out for uh, an upcoming blog post from Fran on that probably in the next few weeks. Um, so one of the other things I wanted to address was kind of just like general content modeling, right? Because WordPress doesn't exist in a vacuum. And when we start talking about headless CMSs, there are lots of other options out there. Um, you know, you got Contentful, Sanity, you know, Strappy, Story, I want to say Story Block, Story Block, I think is the CMS and Story Book is the other thing. You know, so there's lots of the different options out there. And, and you know, some, some people like when, when you're looking at them, clearly WordPress is the only sort of like open source host your own, uh, where lots of these other ones are SaaS based and you're kind of like locked into the vendor platform. I mean, what we find when people are evaluating all of them is like, th there are limitations in those types of tools where with WordPress, it's much easier to just develop your way around those and make it be what you want. So I actually just watched a really good presentation at the next JS Conf on Rapid API and their development team using headless WordPress and saying that exact same thing. Like, look, we looked at all these and it just became like, we'd have to make concessions where with WordPress, it was a little bit of extra elbow grease, but we got exactly the sort of setup that we wanted. I think that's a really powerful thing. It's something like I like as an open source advocate that I can just come in here, muck around and change it to, to fit my needs. Um, it's always like to talk about content modeling. And so one of the tools that we have installed on this site is a tool called Atlas Content Modeler. Um, and so w, if y'all follow WP Engine, you'll know that we also acquired ACF, Advanced Custom Fields. And that is the other plugin in the WordPress space that people use to do um, really heavy content modeling, making really sort of custom content types. Uh, and so I'm showing you ACM, and then I'm also letting you know that right now we're working on a roadmap because there's a lot of overlap between those two plugins. What you'll see here where we create, you know, model a custom post type where we can create custom fields for that post type and then expose those things to the rest in WP GraphQL APIs. So a lot of overlap between those two things. So those two teams are working on a roadmap to sort of like 
bring the best of both worlds. Um, and so stay tuned for updates as those get released because um, I think everybody's really excited about it. So I created a custom model called Space Launches that creates this custom post type menu over here. And I can add all my space launches and I get, you know, really nice editing screens that are totally custom based on, you know, what, what I decided to define in that content model. Um, but what this stuff does is it goes a step further. So it doesn't just let you model the content, but it also sets you up really well for doing it in a headless way, right? Because as soon as we add the, that content model, um, if I come back down here to GraphQL and uh, let me delete this, open up my query thing. And yeah, you know, I'm gonna come down here and like, I can look at space launches. And so if I wanted to query those, I can do that, you know, get the call sign. I think like I had launch date, pilot, you know, we can, we can do that. And like I said, we can have multiple queries in one thing. So let me actually trash this old one, run this one more time, right? So we, we get that, that data automatically added to our GraphQL schema so that we can work with it in our headless front end apps. Um, and then also it gets added to the REST API. So if I want to come down here and query for that data that way, I can do that. Um, and you know, we, we get back all the typical data, but then we get also these ACM fields added to the REST API response. And ACF handles this in a very similar way, right? If we have a post type that has fields defined on it, you have this ACF fields property that you can access. Um, and so re really helpful for the headless devs. And I think that's what you'll see kind of like merged into ACF. It's a little bit more focused on making those things work out of the box for people who want to model data in, in any kind of way. Um, so those are sort of what, what you have available for you um, in that regard. Um, let me just double check how we're doing on time. Perfect, 231, I, I couldn't have planned it better. So I'm gonna hop back to my presentation real quick because that sort of wraps up the differences between the API and we could definitely dig deeper. And we've got content out there that does. So definitely watch Kellen's video. We also have, I think a couple of pieces of content on um, our builders YouTube channel that addresses the differences between REST and GraphQL and like frames them in a fun argument way. So like definitely check that out. Um, and if you haven't, if you, if you use one and haven't used the other, I definitely recommend like trying, trying either one out because you might learn a couple of things. And like I said, there's some tricks with the REST API to make that suitable. And there's lots of uh, ceiling with GraphQL and you can be as fancy as you want and do some really cool stuff. Um, don't want to sound like a producer, but is there an ETA for GA? Um, I'm just checking out the questions. I don't know. I'll let I'll let Fran follow up with that one in the chat. Um, but yeah, so let's hop back in here. ACF. Huh? So oh, we're talking ACF? about AC, ACF yeah, and the content modeling features. Yeah. I, yeah, yeah, we I, can't I, we can't make any promises on a date, but I do know like in um, quarter four of 2022, that's one of the team's primary focuses. Mm -hmm is like baking that in so yep. yeah yes. it's imminent <laughs> how long it'll take not sure but <laughs> yeah we we and i say i say generally most of the people at the company hit hit what they say they're gonna hit um so yeah but like you said we're not definitely in the business of making promises um cool so let's hop back in here and now let's go like one layer deeper and talk about some of the other raw materials that are going to make up our headless site I'm gonna hop back into slideshow mode just for a sec. And we'll just run through a couple of slides. Like, so with Headless, you have a lot of choice in the different frameworks that you use. Um, and so this is really up to you, right? Like, and I said that in that initial diagram, that sort of node application can really be whatever you want. And so do you want it to be a Next.js app? Do you want it to be a Nuxt app? Cool, you can do those things. Do you want it to be an iOS or React Native app? You, you can also do those things too. So there's really no limitation um, for what you can build as the front end of your headless WordPress application, as long as it can use HTTP to talk to GraphQL, to talk to REST and render that data. Um, and so these are some of the most common things that we see people use. Obviously like Next um, is definitely the forerunner in this space as like a meta framework that you know uses React, but sits on top of it, provides you lots of other functionality. I think right behind that, if we look at like our data for what people are searching for, you know, Nuxt is right there with them with Vue. Um, but then we also have Svelte and like I said, all those other options. And when I talk about these things, like I like to sort of talk about them on this spectrum of complexity. 
right? Because like, even though we have these meta frameworks that do all this fancy stuff, like at the end of the day, the web is still just HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. And so like, if you wanted to just upload an HTML page with like a JavaScript thing that hits your WordPress API, like that's a headless site. That's a very simplified headless site, right? And so that's why I like to think about these things on the spectrum of complexity. You could do that and that's totally valid. And, and in a lot of ways, like we have tooling that enables us to do that fancy thing, uh, you know, do that simple thing in a really fancy and performant way. So we've got those things, right? And then in the middle, we still have like our, our front end frameworks, like on their own, right? React and Vue um, and Svelte and not attached to their meta frameworks either, right? And those things serve a purpose. And for a long time, you know, those are the types of headless WordPress sites that I built entirely spa based where I just like ship some Vue and it would do all of the things for me. Um, and so that's kind of like in the middle somewhere. And like, right, as we start to move towards the right side of the chart, uh, I broke out these couple of things for a good reason, right? Because like over here on the right, we've got like Nux, Next, Spelt Kit, and Gatsby. And I put those things all the way over there because like they serve a wide variety of use cases. They're not there just to make websites. They can also build web applications. They can build whatever, you know, they deal with authentication. Like there's all sorts of nuance that these things bring to the table. And then I put 11D and like things like Astro, like one step to the left of that, just because like, they're really focused on websites and static site generation. And so like their scope of what they're trying to do and support is a, is way more limited than something like uh, Next. Um, so I always like to think about this. And so what I wanted us to do real quick is like, let's run through um, a resource that our, our very own Grace Erickson created on like making a headless WordPress site with React um, in a code sandbox. And so we'll kind of like hang out in this middle section for a second. Uh, and then work our way towards the end uh, of this presentation. So let's see if I can pop out of here. And then I'm just going to open up this article. Um, and I'll throw the link in the chat as well. And what Grace did here is we, Grace built out a basic like headless WordPress thing using just React. And one of the things I love about this is that it just uses this code sandbox. Um, and so what I figured we could do is just sort of talk about this and like use this as a good example of what most headless WordPress sites are doing in practice, even though like we may decide to use some fancier tooling to do it. Um, so when we load this up, this is kind of what we get, you know, we have a home page here and if we click around and go through it, you know, you can see like, all right, we're cool. That's our post details page. Um, and again, this is all just a React-based spa. So not using Next. I think it was just like create React app or something. Um, and, and very, very simplified. Like we've got two routes, really. We've got the index route and then we've got our blog slash, uh, you know, post, post slug, post slug route. Um, and so what, what I kind of wanted to do here is let's take our, you know, demo site that we've got out here and let's go ahead and connect that to this code sandbox. And so I'm just going to actually pick and choose some of the different, uh, like I'm going to copy some snippets off screen to just save us a little bit of time and like walk through them, right? So when we're in here, the first thing we're going to want to do is like, uh, no, let's see if I can drag that down here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, did that work the way that I wanted to? No, it didn't. Come on. I want a new directory in my source directory. This is, this is the downside of live code, y'all when stuff doesn't go exactly as planned. Come on, go inside source. Oh, and this is why. I don't use code sandbox a ton and I need to do that. So I'm gonna go ahead and make a, a lib folder. Um, and then inside of my lib folder, I'm going to make just an Apollo JS file. So we're gonna use Apollo as our data fetching client. And then inside of that, I'm just gonna drop uh, this code right here that, that Grace already wrote. So what this does is it just imports Apollo client and an in-memory cache and creates us a new instance of that client. So I'm going to hop back out here um, and grab our GraphQL endpoint and just drop that inside this URI parameter, which is going to sort of make that connection. Um, and so now that we've done that, we need to basically make Apollo available to the rest of our application. So we're going to do that in app.js. So I'm just going to come down here. And now that we've sort of created our client, we're going to import uh, an Apollo provider component and the client that we just configured. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and just basically wrap our app, our switch component inside of that Apollo provider component. 
right? So that just sort of makes uh, the, the Apollo client available pretty much everywhere in our component tree um, and lets us fetch data from our individual components. So now we'll hop into our actual components and just start sort of start looking at what those look like. Right now, we're just using some dummy data, which I think is just like, uh, you know, some JSON that's stubbed out, particularly like a GraphQL response uh, would be. And um, what we're going to want to do is sort of replace those dummy data calls with our actual uh, data fetching code. So like, let me make sure I've saved all this stuff. And really nothing has changed yet. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to hop down here um, to the bottom of this file. And we'll just, I'm just going to copy and paste all of this in there and then sort of go through it like we want. And oh, cool. It already re-renders and you can see all of my fancy hipster ipsum uh, stuff in, in the rendering in there. Right. So what we did is we deleted our dummy code and then we imported, you know, the use query hook from Apollo client and this GQL helper which then helps us format our GraphQL query. Um, and so we do that, right? We're getting some posts, we're getting the database ID, title, date, slug, author with the name, which I don't think actually exists on this install, and then the featured image. Um, and then inside of our component, right? We, we call that query, we call the use query hook and we get these variables back after we destructure like a loading, a loading variable error and then our data. Um, and so if loading, you know, we show the loading indicator, if error, we do that. Um, and then once we get our data, we map through it and pass it into these postcard parameters. Um, yep. And so I, I, I like hipster coders, affogato, quinoa, taxidermy. Yeah. And as an elder millennial, my love language is self-deprecating humor. So that's, that's why I chose a bunch of this strange stuff. Um, so cool. So let's go ahead and save that out. And you saw kind of how easy that was to do with not a lot of code, right? We bootstrapped our Apollo client. We formatted a GraphQL query. And the other thing I'll mention is if we kind of copy this um, and bring it back into graphical IDE and then paste it in here and run it, we should get the same data. So if you're ever kind of questionable about what does my data look like, you can always do that. And that's one of the really nice things about this paradigm is you can really easily hop back and forth. Uh, but now if I click on artists and air plant chicharrones, I don't actually have that component tied up. So that's sort of our next step is to look at uh, the post page content. And so we'll kind of scroll down here and I'm going to do the same thing again. Where I just, I'm just going to come down and copy like the ending uh, thing for Grace's post. And we'll just paste this in here. And then give that a save. Uh, what do we do? Props, I print. Uh -huh. Let's refresh real quick. Do no, I? Guess I guess not. No, it might be in post list, but that looks fine. Yeah, okay. But we'll, we'll, we'll kind of move on. I appreciate everybody hanging with me. Um, and I'm sure this is a long post with a lot of detail that I tried to run through in five minutes. So uh, that, that's, that's what I get for trying to be ambitious. But here we go, because um, we've got about 15, 15-ish 15 minutes left. And so with that, I'll sort of also try and jump the shark one more time. And we'll kind of take a gander uh, one step lower on that complexity chain one step further on that complexity chain. So if we pop back into here, um, right? We talked about some of this stuff and I think that's great. And like, you know, it's cool that we can get the code sandbox to work that easily um, when Jeff follows the instructions like he should. But that's not really what we want for production WordPress applications, right? Um, and so most of the, what our customers and partners deliver are stuff in this category, right? N N Gatsby apps, Nuxt apps, next apps, uh, things like that. So I think that sort of begs the question for us, how do we move from all these different raw materials and these principles uh, to a finished house in practice? And so what I had in mind for us to do is just to sort of show you all how easily you can deploy a Next.js application on our Atlas platform. Um, and so what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to actually start with um, another See, I'm going to go out to GitHub real quick. Actually, I don't think I need to do that. No, I don't. Um, so I'm going to hop back in here into our Atlas environment. And what we're going to do is we're going to 
take a starter that I created as a part of our learning materials and just sort of deploy that against the, the demo WordPress backend that we have set up already. Um, so to do that, I'm gonna go ahead and click create app. Uh, and then we've got two options. We can start with a blueprint or pull from your own repo. For this one, I'm gonna pull from our own repo. Um, if you're definitely getting started and wanna take a look at blueprints, um, you can do that too. So I'm gonna go ahead and click pull from repo. And then if I haven't authenticated with GitHub, it's going to ask me to do that, but I'm already good here. So I'm just going to select my repo. Uh, and the one we'll deploy is this crash, crash course, Headless WP Next with WP GraphQL. Um, and then I don't need to do that. And if I was deploying in like a mono research repo pattern, you can do that and like specify a different root directory. Um, but we're going to leave that as is. And then I'm going to go ahead and click continue. I think I already have one. So we'll try just, you know, We'll call this uh, next starter. I'm gonna deploy it in US Central. Um, yep, and somebody posted in there our WP Engine uh, developers roadmap. All of these, most of this stuff is on the roadmap. Um, so if you wanna kind of like continue and deep dive into anything that we talked about today, I, I would say that this is like a high level overview of a lot of what's in there. And I'm using a lot of the same resources. So we have a whole tutorial on how, to, how we built this application. Um, so I'm going to deploy it in US Central, go ahead and click continue. And then it's going to ask me a couple of different questions. So it's going to ask me to select a branch. And so with this particular project, I had a main branch, which is like the beginning guts of it, and then a finished branch, uh, which is everything finished. So I'm going to select that one. I'm going to say I already have my WordPress instance because I'm using one already. I'll just point that at my demo content hub. And then for this one, I don't actually want to install any headless WordPress plugins because I already have... Um, I already have some of that installed. So what I would do want to do, however, is pass it a environment variable that is going to tell my app where my WordPress site lives. Um, so let's go ahead and snag that. I'll be very careful here because of how I did this earlier. Okay, so cool. So now this should be good. I'm going to go ahead and click create app and you know, that's going to successfully, like it's going to spin and build for just a second. And instead of us kind of watching that one, I'm going to hop back out here and just show you all what uh, the this finished product looks like on one I started just a second ago. So we can sort of like walk you through some of the stuff that you get. Um, so if I click this Atlas URL link, that's going to open me up to sort of the public preview of my page. So we can see all those same posts that I had on that other site are coming through. Everything is built using static site generation. So it's super fast um, and, you know, serving Next.js in production. Um, but if I come back into the user portal, there's a lot of really helpful stuff here, right? Because like there's a lot of overlap between what Atlas does and what say something like for sale or Netlify offers. But I think there's some benefits to this solution as well for people doing headless WordPress specifically. Right, because at that point you're managing two different things, and the WordPress instance that you have isn't a SaaS application like Sanity, isn't a SaaS application like Contentful, and so you know that's an extra thing to manage. Where this kind of simplifies that relationship, where each Atlas instance encapsulates both your front end environment and your WordPress environment, so that you can get to both easily and manage them both kind of using the same tool set. Um, but we also have a lot of the same features that those platforms do as well. And so if I open up settings in here, um, two of the things that we just released are the ability for you to do PR preview environments. So if I click that on and we're to open up a pull request against that repo, it's going to rebuild you an entire environment based on that PR uh, so that you can preview it and you manage the life cycle of that environment totally based on you know, that PR life cycle. So if I close it or decide to merge it, it'll kill off that environment. And all of those PR preview environments don't count against like your allotment. So you can have pretty much functionally unlimited. The number is not unlimited, but I can't see anybody reaching that. Um, and then we also have this environment webhook, which allows you to rebuild your site. So with my site, for example, this is all static site generation. I've only got 10 posts. So I wanted them all to be built ahead of time. But let's say I add a new post or I make changes to a post. How do I make sure that um, you know my, my site reflects those changes in my WordPress database? And what this allows you to do is to create a rebuild webhook. And then you can use that and install any one of the webhook plugins that WordPress repository has, hook that up. And so listen to any one of those events and on post update or on post create, 
it'll trigger a rebuild on the Atlas side so that everything gets rebuilt again based on uh, whatever preferences you set in those build scripts. Um, so cool. I think that sort of gets us to, yeah, all right. I was fairly, fairly on time. Definitely allows for some time for some questions. So I'll hop back in here and we can, you know, take a look at those. Yeah, please, Sam, hit, hit us with it. Yeah, so this is a very loaded question, but figured I'd throw this out there for anyone who's here listening to how it's all set up and everything. <laughs> Sorry for all the coughing in the background, geez. Um, when should we use headless WordPress? And I know that's a loaded question, but is there some, what are some resources that someone can look at to find out the answer to that also? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So I'm actually gonna hop back out to our website and we've got some good resources on that um, right here. Like when should I use headless WordPress? And this is really centered around a lot of the benefits that headless WordPress provides. And, you know, I kind of mentioned those, some of those in the beginning, right? We've got like, um, you know, things like speed, improved performance and perceived performance with Next.js. And may maybe we can see this in action. Like I mentioned, um, the idea of link prefetching, Let's see if I, I enabled this, I should have. Um, but when we do that, we can see that when we ho hover over these different things, Next.js is actually going out and like fetching us the data that we need for our artisan air plant Chicharrones post before somebody goes to it so that it's like that, that navigation is totally seamless. Um, and I think, you know, Next.js's routing in general is kind of like interesting because it uses those, um, you know, like that, that sort of hybrid method where it'll, you know, send you down this server statically generated page and then you know you can layer on spa routing so that it's only replacing parts of the post that it need, needs to i mean it makes all of that really happen fast and yep callen's got a good decision tool so, out there as well so there yeah, was a question it, by um yeah that that decision tool actually when i was starting out uh kellen's one of the shoulders of giants i stood on yes when for i was sure. a young youngster padawan in a boot camp long many moons ago uh two years ago uh but anyway um yeah the, and there was a question in the chat too uh as far as like just to make sure people are aware um i hope i'm not butchering your name is it ifo or ifo but um jeff is not using fast.js which is the open source framework that our team here at wp engine has developed to make the uh the time to quick hello world as I like to call it off headless WordPress that much quicker built on top of Next.js Faust is built on top of Next.js it is not needed on Atlas vice versa you can use Faust.js on a Netlify or Vercel or um, AWS Amplifier whatever node host you might have um, yeah. when would you want to use Faust.js definitely you would want to use Faust.js um, for I think this is just my opinion I and then I want Kellen and Jeff's opinion. But number one, if you are a PHP developer, that all of a sudden your organization has told you, hey, y'all, we are moving to headless WordPress and I need you to work with this JavaScript developer, but it needs to be like in kind of like the um, model of traditional WordPress, you want to use Faust.js because it, uh, obeys that WordPress template hierarchy, and out of the box, the connectivity is literally sticking a environment variable, your your endpoint, into the front end, and your post and your pages, the the exact post types that ship out of the box with WordPress, will render on your front end. And post previews are 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 done. We we've done that for you. you don't have to configure it. You don't have to fix anything. It's done with auth and cookies. We're you're good on that. That's number one. And then number two, just from a perspective is if your organization from a business decision decides to stick with WordPress as a CMS for the near and immediate future, maybe even the far future, um, the, the way that our team future-wise is working on the Faust um, project, the open source project, is to continuously follow and make WordPress easier. So it kind of future proofs these versions that we're releasing in order to what you and the community tell us that you want to see in headless WordPress. So, yeah. Yeah. And I'll kind of piggyback on that too. Like, cause Fran mentioned 
post previews and like Faust is a two part deal. So it's the front end framework. And then it's also a, a PHP plugin that exists on the back end to like help facilitate some of that stuff. And so like post previews is something that traditionally people would have to roll their own. Like, and again, if we go back to my REST API example, that's a privileged thing. Like for you to see a preview, you need to be logged in. And so like a couple of years ago, that was difficult. People had to implement that on their own. Faust kind of comes along and like simplifies that. I would say the same thing with auth in general. If you want to do something where people need to log in and create posts or, you know, make mutations against the GraphQL API, that's another thing that Faust facilitates. It is based on Next.js, so it does sort of lock you into Next.js, um, which I think is important to point out. So like if you're coming from Nuxt, like, yeah, you've either got to go Next.js or you can try and use the backend plugin, which is a lot of what we're seeing people do now, right? It's like, got the backend plugin, like how do I wire that up to Nuxt to get the same benefit? Um, so hopefully in the next you know couple of quarters, there's some more examples around that stuff that we can start to share that is how to use the Faust plugin with um, you know, some of these other frameworks. But it is not required. And like we're going to do a, an office hours where we actually speed deploy all of the different frameworks on Atlas just to kind of prove a point about that. And like Fran said, Faust, you can take it anywhere you want and should and, and does work on Vercel and Netlify. And we have people in the Discord community that like have their Faust site hosted over there. So it definitely will we'll kind of live anywhere that you can run those JavaScript apps. And just one thing I did want to circle back on, um, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm super, I'm always stoked y'all, but I'm super, super stoked. Once um, y'all, um, I released the uh, WP GraphQL Evercache on Next.js blog post. Um, and then we're going to release documentation on how to do that with other hosting providers, because right now it only works uh, with WP P Engine Varnish. This is a game changer for headless WordPress, y'all. You're going to see the cache invalidation strategy and how much that fresh data literally updates, and then you don't even hit the WordPress server, right? So it's like cost savings, carbon footprint savings, and then mm -hmm. your users are just having this glorious experience. So um, stay, stay tuned for that. There's a, lo a lot of stuff is coming out from our team. Yeah, and Sam, plug the Discord community. Uh, definitely, that's a great way to hang out with us. Um, if you've got common questions, you know, like there, there's, I think we're up to about seven, just over 700 people in that space. Um, so lots of people, lots of headless WordPress knowledge. And if you're looking to get started and have questions, that's a great place to ask them to get answers from the community. Um, so definitely want to plug that as well. Yeah, so... John, this is my challenge. Way too many options. Yeah, and I think, and, and to to so this is this is John's point. This is a great a great point. Um, you know, challenge with this just way too many options. All these conversations tend to answer these multiple, you know, seventeen choice questions on what stack to use. And there's just there, and, and I, I I sort definitely can feel that and agree with that. Um, and so that is definitely like on our radar as a company who's kind of, you know, working in this space. And that's one of the reasons you see Faust happen is because it's like, can we just condense all of the accumulated knowledge we have about how to do this um, into one space, one plugin or one framework? And, and that's kind of what we're seeing happen, um, as well as seeing that happen also on the plugin space or realizing that, hey, installing 10 different plugins to get all this stuff to work, it, it, it's fatiguing for the developer, for the site maintainer. And so can we simplify that by collapsing this like functionality into one or two things? Um, and then also that's where our blueprints come in handy as well. Because like, I didn't really run through that, but, um, you know, looking forward, I think a lot of that will, will kind of come into play. Like if I were to deploy, a, yeah, let's leave. It's going to let me leave. It doesn't want to let me leave. So if I would have gone and deployed a blueprint, a blueprint is a front end code repository, but it's also a collection of plugins and settings on the back end. So like, you know, you don't have to manually install those plugins. We're just like spin up this blueprint and you click a button and have all these things pre-installed for you so that you don't really have to think about it. Um, so, you know, thanks for, thanks for the feedback there. We definitely hear you. Um, 
let's see what else we got blueprints and then we said i think taylor will fast change with the next js 13 updates yes uh that's what we're hearing from that team is that most of the stuff that they mentioned at the last conference uh should be supported it's not um it's not going to be out of the box and i think we're probably going to wait some time for that stuff to like you know dribble out into general availability before they before they jump on it but the team is very wrapped up in next and obviously being associated with next they're they're definitely thinking about how to future proof that stuff yeah and one and th thank you for mentioning next 13 um lee robinson who's the head of devrel at Vercel, has been a continuous guest on our podcast I actually literally just hit him up after we got off a meeting here to talk about next 13 and, he, and he's going to come back on. So stay tuned for that. Yeah. Cool. Well, awesome folks. I think we're probably pushing, push. Oh, we're over the hour, but thanks for hanging in there. Um, we really appreciate everybody coming out to our inaugural like live headless WordPress open office hours. Um, and just to keep you all sort of in the loop about what we've got going on, uh, this is going to be kind of an every other week, uh, Thursday afternoon sort of thing. This quarter is a little bit uh, funky because of the holidays, but on what do we say, 11, 11, I think, two weeks from today, uh, we're going to have the Faust team come for a demo. So if you're into that stuff, yep, definitely come check us out. And then I think we've got a couple of other great, great events and great topics planned for you that'll like dig a little bit deeper on what we started today. Um, so definitely, yep hang with us, follow us on all the things, hang out in discord with us. Um, we really appreciate your support and participation. Yeah. It's going to be awesome. Right. Until then y'all happy coding. Yep. Bye.